here. Are you guys going to sing a couple songs first? What would you read from the book first? Yeah. Read from the book let's first get, and then read. do some songs. Let's All right? Read. Let's yeah. welcome Joe Eistrike to the stage. Come on. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, right now. Use okay? it, use it, use it. I'll turn the, I'll turn the echo off. Okay. I had the Bruce Springsteen echo on. Listen, can everybody hear me okay if I just read like this? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. If it ends up being not loud enough, just All right. somebody go like this and I'll slide over here. Um, thanks so much to John and everybody here at the Lido Gallery for hosting this really cool event. There are like interesting snacks around the corner there, mm. super cool gifts here in the shop. Uh, we'll be selling some books afterwards. I'll be signing some books if anybody you know, would like me to deface your copy of the book. Um, I'm going to read a little bit from the first chapter here. You know what, Joe? I would, should I, should I, yeah, I, I shut the echo off. Okay. This way your cameraman will get there we a good go. song. All right, I'll, I'll go ahead. Good. There, that's smart. You want to okay. Your that sounds good, John. Thanks. So um, I'm going to read a little bit from the first chapter here. The headliners. I don't think you need to know anything going into this other than the fact that the band Watershed is about to go on a two-week tour and my wife, for reasons that will become clear in about five minutes, isn't exactly thrilled about this prospect. Okay? So, I'll read a little bit, we'll play a song or two, if there are any questions we can answer some questions, other than that we can go eat snickerdoodles and drink some tea. Okay, so this is from the headliners. First thing you learn is that you always gotta wait. Wait to get noticed, wait to get signed, wait to get famous. I'm standing backstage behind black door curtains, waiting to go on. Pre-show jitters have me shifting from my right sneaker to my left and back like a kindergartner ten kids deep in the restroom line. A pap's long neck sweats in my hand. I take a pull and I dry my palm down the thigh of my girl cut jeans. Then I lean against the cinder block wall, heavily sharpied with graffiti, Call for a discreet blowjob! And clever rebuttals from the graffiti annotators. What's a discreet blowjob? Will I notice it? <laughs> and I wait. Oh, I, I'm just going to apologize right now for the language. <laughs> this is a book about rock and roll, so I guess you got to expect some of that. Let's do, I am an English professor, so I'll explain it this way. I'm incorporating the vernacular of the genre. <laughs> and I wait. Biggie pokes his head between the curtains, a mag light stretching from his mouth like a metal cigar. We're set to pop, he says. He aims the beam at my base. Let's do this. Where's everybody else, I say. He takes the light from his mouth and draws figure eights across the backstage area. They aren't back here? Before I can shake my head no, Biggie has pulled the curtain shut and disappeared. I take a drink and imagine what waits on the other side. A sports arena. The floor sold out from row A to double Z, and girls smelling like fruit-flavored perfume and bummed cigarettes, wrapped tight in low-slung jeans, their belly buttons pierced, their breasts defying gravity thanks to the tautness of youth and the bra engineers at Victoria's Secret. <laughs> the girls put one hand on each other's shoulders and boost themselves onto the folding chairs to see over the heads of the boys standing in front of them. These dough-faced boys in their new concert t-shirts, half drunk on parking lot beers, thwack each other and point out which steroided up security guards to avoid when, the second the lights go down, they'll ass an elbow up to the front row. Until then, everybody keeps an eye on the stage, studying a roadie as he puts the gear through the final tweaks, the testing, testing, one, two, threes, and wank, wank, power chords, <laughs> to make doubly and triply sure the guitars and amps are wired for sound. The digitally reproduced voice of ACDC's Brian Johnson blasts through the PA at 102 decibels, FIRE! <laughs> Saluting those about to rock. Marijuana smoke wafts to the ceiling trusses. In every few minutes the crowd noise swells when a whole section thinks they've seen a band member mingling with the stagehands, VIPs, and contest winners who huddle in the wings. Just before the house lights drop, the stage manager appears. He walks coolly from rig to rig, giving the microphone cables, speaker wires, and blinking red lights the tangled landscape of rock a final once-over. Then he pulls a mag light from his back pocket and shines it toward the mixing board, across the sea of the floor, 
over the backwards ball caps of the boys in row J, over the hairsprayed heads of the girls in row K, through the rising smoke and devil horn fists and ACDC fire, <laughs> commanding one and all to stand up and be counted for what we are about to receive. The message the mag light carries 52 rows back to the sound man and the light tech and an arena full of kids who've paid 50 bucks and waited months for this very moment is this. It's showtime. It is showtime. But from my spot backstage in this Detroit bar on this Thursday night, funny. <laughs> here's what I see when I pull open the curtains. 20 by 20 feet of wide open floor. No chattering girls in row K. No blustery boys in row J. There aren't any rows. Hell, there aren't any seats. So no, there's not even one security thug on duty. The spot right in front of the stage is anyone's for the taking. But there aren't any takers. Tonight, in this club, dishearteningly named Small's Bar, the front row is empty. I walk through the curtains and out to the floor. There are exactly five people in the audience. Five people who've paid five dollars each to see Watershed play a 50-minute set. All five are excruciatingly well-behaved, standing in the back, politely waiting for us to start. Everyone seems hyper-aware of his voice, speaking in hushed tones, not wanting to disturb the peace. The sound guy has queued up the Foo Fighters, but quietly. Detroit may be Rock City, but Small's Bar is as loud as a library. I move toward the stage where the opening band, a local act that was supposed to help fill out the crowd, should be tearing down their gear. But earlier, when we were checking in to the Fairfield Inn, we got an email from the guy who owns Small's. Opener dropped off the bill. Tonight doesn't look promising. I'm okay with canceling. We shook our heads and laughed. What else could we do? This is the first night of the tour, the launch party, headlining in Detroit, baby, home of Motown Records and the MC5, the Stooges and the White Stripes. If we drove 200 miles to play for five people, so be it. No way we were canceling. Still, as I scan the back wall where the crowd is leaning like a police lineup, it depresses me that I know four of the five by name. There's Joe the Animal who's a semi-pro football player, and he always helps us load and unload the van. In fact, a few hours ago, when we pulled up to the club for load-in, the animal was standing on the sidewalk wearing weightlifting gloves, doing torso twists and knee bends. I got here early, he said, holding the door open for me, because I know you guys will sell out a dump like this. I didn't want to undermine his optimism, so as I hefted my bases past him, I said, we'll find out soon enough, animal. He followed me into the bar, taking in Smalls and all its smallness. <laughs> this joint doesn't sell advance tickets or anything, he said. I didn't tell him that we rarely play venues that sell tickets of any kind, let alone in advance. A hand stamp? Absolutely. Wristband? Sure. But tickets? This is a real rock club, man, I said. We love playing shows like this. Now, as I'm walking toward the bar to see if Biggie has found my bandmates, the animal spots me. He checks his watch and gestures toward the mostly empty room as if to say, you love playing shows like this? Compared to lots of bars we play, Smalls isn't so small. It's divided into two separate spaces, the band room and the bar room. The band room with its painted cinder block and high ceiling has the feel of a warehouse. Like Detroit itself, the room is industrial, utilitarian. If not for the wooden stage along one wall, it would be a perfect spot for silk screening t-shirts or poly bagging hex nuts. The barroom was built in 1923 as a bank, and the current incarnation recalls the original Captain of Industry era design. Art Deco lamps hang from the coffered ceiling, and stained glass windows throw colors on a mahogany bar top. Connecting the two sides is a border zone with pool tables, a nook for bands to sell their merchandise, and two tiny and well graffitied restrooms. Think airplane laboratories with cocks drawn on the walls. <laughs> the beauty of Small's two-room layout is that you can isolate from whatever misery awaits on the fan side by camping out on the bar side. And there, elbows bent on the mahogany 
is where I find my bandmates. Everyone but Colin, anyway. Dave Massica, the drummer, is trading a five for a Budweiser. <coughs> His salt and pepper hair spiked high as the second cut at Little Turtle Country Club, where he works as a cook. One stool over is Mark Pooch Borer, the rhythm guitar player. He's chatting up the bartender who, with her bangs and tattoos, has got to be a jammer on a roller derby squad. Now, Pooch wears horn rim glasses, so if it was late enough and you were drunk enough, you might catch this scene and swear you saw Buddy Holly making time with Betty Page. So there's Pooch, chewing gum and smiling the smile that makes girls in the crowd, when there are girls, when there is a crowd, gather at his side of the stage and yell, Poochie! But Betty is focusing on our roadie, Ricky C., who's winding through one of his greatest road story hits about the night he met David Johansson of the New York Dolls. So I say to Johansson, Ricky says, I was at the Dolls show in Columbus in 74. And Johansson pauses for a second, starts walking away like he didn't hear me. Then he turns back and says, that's funny, you don't look queer. <laughs> Blue language. Wow, Betty says. Her lips shaped into a red O. That's perfect. Now Biggie's waving the mag light in our faces. You ladies gonna play sometime tonight? I set my empty bottle on the bar. Without taking her eyes off Ricky C, Betty twists a new one open for me. You find Colin? I say to Biggie. You three. He nods towards Dave, Pooch, and me. Get your asses to the stage so we can start the minute I do. And he walks away in search of the AWOL guitar player. Dave laughs and said, says, playing in a rock band is stupid. He and Pooch order up another round of buds and settle deeper into their stools. By most quantifiable standards, playing in a rock band is stupid. Five paying civilians at five bucks a head means come 2 a.m., Watershed will make $25 at the door. Divided by the four guys in the band, that's six twenty-five each. But nobody will pocket his six and a quarter. We almost never see any cash. Instead, we pay for the gas, for the hotels, for the trips up and down the Wendy's Super Value menu. We dig into our pockets to cover five or six shows in a row, hoping to eventually land a high dollar gig that will get us all reimbursed. Sometimes this gamble works, sometimes not. On our most lucrative tours, we come home with a hundred bucks or so. Usually we lose twice that. So we bankroll the gigs the American way with credit cards. Rock now, pay later. <laughs> Even Biggie, the tour manager, is out here on his own nickel. The only member of the watershed camp guaranteed to land in the black is Ricky C., who works for the cut rate of $25 a day. And he only turns a profit because he can eat for a week on Hostess cupcakes and skim milk. When Biggie filled up the tank in Columbus this afternoon, he paid $3.09 a gallon. The drive to Detroit was 200 miles. At 15 miles per gallon, and 15 is a generous estimate, considering the Econoline, 350, is loaded with four band members, two crew guys, our bags, and all the amps, drums, and guitars, we've already burnt $41.19 in fuel. We haven't yet played a note, and the one thing I know for sure about tonight's show is that we'll lose money. At closing time, Biggie will settle up with the doorman, and then he'll stuff the bills into the great pouch he keeps stashed in the dashboard. Tomorrow, tonight's $25 take will get us a third of the way to Milwaukee. Here in the minor leagues, bands don't play for sex, fame, and fortune. They play for gasoline. An economist would tell us that by driving three hours to perform for five people, we have not behaved in our monetary self-interest. It's Econ 101, supply and demand. <coughs> there clearly isn't much demand for watershed in Detroit, so we would have been smart to cut off the supply by staying home, get a good night's sleep, wake up tomorrow and commute to our real jobs, jobs that actually pay. I used to think of gigs like this as investments in the future. We're paying dues now, I tell myself, for the big rock star payoff later. The trouble is I'm now 38 years old. So is Colin. Dave is 43. Pooch is the youngest at 35. By music business standards, we're too damn old for the rock star payoff. So now I have to wonder, what future? Besides, we already had a shot at stardom. And we whiffed. Remember your crappy high school band? 
The one you formed after you finally got that guitar for your birthday. You practiced down in the basement, learning Smoke on the Water and Iron Man and You Really Got Me. Crossing your fingers you'd stick together long enough to write a song that some other crappy high school band might one day cover. A couple years later you called it quits, bowing to the entropic forces that went to work starting with that very first practice. Egos, insecurities, differing motivations. Because crappy high school bands are supposed to break up. Like the Brian Adams song, Jimmy Quit, Jody Got Married. My crappy high school band is headlining Smalls tonight. Colin and I started it the summer before our junior year. We didn't know Dave and Pooch back then, but Biggie was with us, setting up gear and getting us to the stage on time. In the years since, we've played over a thousand shows in 34 states and 116 cities. We've humped our amps through the doors at CBGB 10 times. We played the House of Blues on the Sunset Strip, the Metro in Chicago, the Rat in Boston. We played on South Street in Philly on 6th Avenue in Austin, at the 7th Street entry in Minneapolis, and above a gay bar called Rods in Madison. We played 58 different venues in Columbus alone. Small's Bar is the 15th place we've played in Detroit. Okay, now, how many of these do we think we can remember? Okay? All right. Small's, the I Rock, Finney's, Paychecks, Lily's 21. Uh, St. Andrews. St. Andrews. Fallout. Fallout? How right. does, what's that? Fallout Shelter. The Shelter. The, no. shelter. the, shelter. the Foundry. Foundry. Alvin's. 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 That's a good one. Three, 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 three D and Royal Oak. You said Finney's, right? Fin the, the Ritz. The Impound. Yes. <laughs> the Impound. Hayloft. I That's remember that close. Hayloft. Jacoby's. Jacoby's. Yeah. Okay. Well, that was pretty good, right? <laughs> <laughs> I've got this all written down someplace. It's all very carefully researched. Right? I'm a professional. We've released six full-length albums, a batch of cassettes, 45s, and EPs, a couple videos, and a DVD. Colin, Biggie, and I have been together longer than the Beatles, The Doors, and Nirvana combined. Watershed's long haul hasn't been all sparse crowds and dive bars. At one point, we almost made it. We were limoed around Manhattan. We recorded in the same studio as ACDC, Aerosmith, and Springsteen. We played arenas and amphitheaters, headlining shows in front of thousands, opening for bands everybody's heard of. We were treated to fancy dinners and promised by insiders that we were the next big thing. But we never had a hit song, never had a video on MTV, never won the notoriety that comes measured in songwriting residuals or on the Billboard Hot 100. And yet, somehow, we stayed in the game for two decades, like a hustling utility man with a great glove but no bat, a hitless wonder. By now, most musicians we've shared the stage with, famous and not, have packed away their guitars and decided to sell real estate or insurance. In the 50s, in fact, selling insurance was a euphemism for quitting. Hey, what's Bill up to? Bill could be a shoeshine boy or a CEO, but if he was no longer rocking, he was selling insurance. <laughs> then again, in the 50s, one nickname for the guitar was the Starvation Box. So it should surprise no one that rock and roll has always been a struggle. The story here is not that Watershed has had it tough. Every band has it tough. The story here is that most bands with Watershed's career arc quit long before they're reduced to playing for crowds they can count on one hand. So maybe playing this show is a little stupid. Maybe we booked this tour because we built an inertia that's stronger than our better judgment. But I suspect the real reason is a million times simpler and more complicated. Watershed has dragged ourselves up to Detroit because we're a rock band. And playing live, whether it's for five people or 15,000, is what rock bands do. Stupid or not. Here at the bar, Dave is catching Pooch and me up on the gossip from the country club. My Percocet dealer calls me Frankenstein now, Dave says. He goes wide-eyed and zombie-like, his arms straight and stiff. He's created a monster. Biggie's silhouetted by the jukebox, rubbing a dollar on his jeans to iron it flat. He's given up the search for Colin. Joe the Animal has wandered over from the band side. Still no Colin? When none of us answer, he smiles and says, I'll hunt him down for you. 
And even though the animal's voice is pure Michigander, something in that smile is reminding me of Quint, Robert Shaw's character from Jaws. And I'm bracing for him to follow up with, and I'll catch him and kill him for ten. <laughs> Forget Colin Animal, I say over the replacements, Bastards of Young, which Biggie has blasting from the bar speakers. See this? I motion toward Dave and Pooch, toward Biggie at the jukebox and Ricky C down the bar. The five of us, this is the band. Pooch and Dave nod at this, one of our regular bits. Whenever two or three of us are separated from the rest, we badmouth the other guys. Say that we are the real band, regardless of who we happen to be at that moment. <laughs> For all I know, Colin is standing out on the street right now telling anyone who will listen that he's the band. Who could blame him? The whole operation was his idea after all. Sparked in the eighth grade, the year he talked me into buying a bass. Colin and I spent our afternoons that summer sitting on the floor of his garage, prepping copies of the Columbus Dispatch for our paper route. His hair was short and blonde, the color of a Pony League infield baking in the August sun. Mine was feathered rusty brown, that same infield but sprayed with a hose. Our hands were newsprint stained and lined with rubber band welts. As we folded and rolled the papers, we'd talk Ohio State football, Reds baseball, and Georgia championship wrestling. But mostly with QFM 96, Ohio's best rock, cranking from Collins Jam Box, we talked Aerosmith, Bad Company, Blue Oyster Cult, Rainbow, Billy Squire, Bob Seger. We lived in the Columbus suburb of Worthington. Named, as the Ohio-shaped signs at the city limits said, for Thomas Worthington, the father of Ohio statehood. Despite the historical pedigree, Worthington was a fairly run-of-the-mill Ington suburb. And by Ington, I mean you can put whatever prefix in front of the Ington you want. In this case, it was worth Ington. Right? You get it. <laughs> Town planners and real estate developers are suckers for Ington. Ington promises quiet charm, class, and distinction. When you walk through the threshold of an Ington home, you enter a community of ox roasts on the village green and sticky block parties where the fire department brings a hook and ladder to spray down the kids. Ington city councils pass zoning laws that mandate neo-colonial architecture. Downtown Ington is a painfully cozy strip dotted with a hardware store, a dress boutique, a flower shop, an art gallery, an ice cream shop, and an old-time pharmacy. There are no golden arches in Ington. Instead, there's a tasteful wooden sign that seems to announce apologetically, um, McDonald's? <laughs> you know the place. If not in Ington, then maybe a blank hills or a blank heights cul-de-sac pock towns your punk ass couldn't wait to bolt from. The cops had nothing to do but harass you and your buddies for ding-dong ditching or TPing or for whatever good old-fashioned neo-colonial trouble you could get into. When you were growing up there, you hated Inkton. You hated it almost as much as you hated those spoiled pricks from your biggest sports rival, Upper Inkton. <laughs> Our subdivision was called Worthington Estates, but don't let the name fool you. The aluminum-sided houses sat on quarter-acre plots and were nowhere near estate-like. My house was indistinguishable from at least five <coughs> others on my street. One afternoon in the garage, Colin flipped through the arts section and read that Cheap Trick was coming to Columbus. Oh, we're going to this, he said. For months, I've been cranking at Budokan loud enough to make my sister slam her bedroom door shut. I can still hear the opening seconds. Japanese girls in high howl. Tom Peterson checking his bass. The goosebump inducing introduction. All right, Tokyo! <laughs> Are you ready? Will you please welcome epic recording artists? Hell yes, I wanted to go see Cheap Trick. But mostly I wanted to go see Cheap Trick with Colin. He was cool, and I was not. He had a fort in his backyard. He had Atari. And unlike anyone else I knew, he'd already been to a rock concert. For his 10th birthday, his mom had taken him to Cleveland to see Kiss. Like all kids, I thought my parents were weird, but they seemed even weirder when compared with the gals. Colin's dad sold wood products. His mom stayed home. Solid suburban citizens. My dad was an ex-priest, and my mom was an ex-nun. 
They'd met in grad school and then left the church to get married. Now my dad was directing a facility that trained blind folks in employment skills, and my mom was teaching English part-time at Columbus Tech. They were both finishing PhDs at Ohio State. Given that my sister and I were the only kids in Worthington with an ex-priest and nun for parents, we were weird by definition. <laughs> but if I went with Colin to see Cheap Trick, maybe I'd pick up some residual cool. Colin and I scored seventh row seats, then rode the Coda bus downtown to the Ohio Center for the show. It was even more jaw-dropping than I knew it would be. Rick Nielsen's guitar blew my hair back. Bunny Carlos's kick drum socked me in the gut. Tom Peterson's 12-string bass knocked my balls into my throat. Split-second eye contact from debonair frontman Robin Zander had the girls next to me screaming like they were seeing the Beatles at Shea. The arena smelled like perfume, cigarettes, and weed. Piss and puke soaked the bathroom floor. When the band launched into their new single, She's Tight, the arena rained panties. On the bus ride home, Colin said, we have to start a band. <laughs> Like so many life-changing moments, this one came as an afterthought. Six throwaway words tucked inside 60,000 others as we talked a mile a minute on that bus. The lack of fanfare with which it was said was a testament to the inevitability of my answer. There was no internal debate on my, de on my part, no deliberation. Following Colin into battle was already my specialty. Earlier that summer, he decided that I should take over half the paper route. Then he recruited me as his aide-de-camp in a campaign to terrorize his neighbors with cottonelle and rotten eggs. So when Colin told me we were starting a band, I just shrugged and said okay, and that was that. As the bus rolled up High Street past the Ohio State campus, Colin laid out his plan for rock domination. For Christmas, his mom had bought him a Gibson Melody Maker, so naturally he'd be the guitar player. The only instrument I owned was the clarinet I'd played in third grade orchestra. But my dad kept a guitar in his closet, a Martin acoustic he'd strummed when presiding mass. As soon as I figured out how to play that church guitar, Colin and I would be a two-headed monster. Colin looked confused. But I'm the guitar player, he said. We need two, don't we? I caught our reflection in the bus window. We were all knees and knuckles draped in the bootleg concert shirts we bought for five bucks in the parking lot. Yeah, Colin, I said, we need two, like Paul Stanley and Ace Fraley. Any schmuck can play the guitar, Colin said. Then he flashed the same smile his dad surely used when selling his line of cedar hangers and shoe trees to department stores. You, Joe, get to play the bass. I cringed. Bass was only slightly cooler than clarinet. No, man, Colin said, bass players are the coolest, like Gene Simmons, like Tom Peterson. By the time the bus eased into the estates, Colin had given our band a name. Sudden shock, exclamation point. <laughs> and a logo, SS, in two stylized lightning bolts. We drew this logo all over the bus seat, SS, lightning bolts. The next passenger must have thought the seat had been occupied by Hitler U. <laughs> the bus pulled away from the curb and we slapped each other five. Then Colin took off toward his house and I headed toward mine, playing air bass to Cheap Trick's Gonna Raise Hell the whole way home. Now, as if on cue, Colin walks into Smalls. He's met by the doorman who's asking for five bucks and a look at Colin's ID. Slim-shouldered and 140 pounds, give or take a few Budweiser's, Colin's not much bigger now than he was on that Coda bus. Smiling that son of a salesman smile, he explains that he's with the band. And then he beelines for the bar. So Biggie says, what's the beer situation? Biggie pulls 20 wooden tokens from his pocket. Free domestics. Beautiful, Colin says. Dave and Pooch divide the tokens into four stacks of five. Look at us, Colin says. He's holding a to-go coffee with one hand, mussing his hair with the other. Out on tour, all set to rock, he puts his hand on my shoulder and says, we've got our balls back. What he means is, you've got your balls back. Watershed hasn't played a show in five months, not since the August night in Columbus when we celebrated the release of our live CD, Three Chords and a Cloud of Dust 2. A couple days later, I committed the cardinal sin. I moved away, far away. 
My wife Kate and I packed our furniture into a freight-sized Penske and drove across the country to Tacoma, Washington, where I'd taken a job as a visiting English professor at Pacific Lutheran University. For one year, I'd teach and write, and Kate would finish her dissertation. Colin was hurt, disappointed, pissed off. As far as he was concerned, I checked my balls at the Ohio State line. Order up quick, ladies, Biggie says, tapping his mag light on the bar. Time to make with the rock. Colin rakes his stack of drink tokens. Joe the animal isn't going anywhere, he says. Biggie and Ricky C. beat it to the band side to run the guitars through one last tuning. And Betty the bartender raises her eyebrows to ask who wants what. I'll take five Budweiser's, Dave says. How many you want, Pooch? Four, Pooch says to Betty. Then he flips his last token toward Dave. And one Percocet, Pooch says. While the drummer and rhythm guitarist negotiate their buzzes, I slide over to Colin, who's alternating between coffee and beer, a poor man's speedball. <laughs> I ask him where he found the coffee. Small's Bar is in Hamtramck, a part of Detroit you wouldn't want to explore at night on foot. King Video and Convenience Mart, he says, across the street. He makes a wafting motion over the cup. It's not bad. I'm getting notes of beef jerky and pork rind. <laughs> Betty is lining up beers two at a time, and Dave is reaching into his coat pocket, fulfilling Pooch's painkiller prescription. Out on the road again, I say to Colin. We needed to get out of the house and rock a little bit, he says. You made it happen. I raise my beer to him. Credible bars, visible cities. I don't give a shit about the gigs, Colin says. It's great just to be hanging out with my friends. Like Colin, I'm jacked to be back with the guys. But as we stand here sipping beer, I have no doubt he does give a shit about the gigs. We all do. We need this tour to tell us there's still a place in rock and roll for old lizards like us. But neither of us can say as much, not out loud, not when we're about to take the stage for five people. Soon Biggie's heading our way. He looks ready to beat somebody down. Seriously, he says, let's go fucking go. I shoulder my bass and walk to my usual spot in front of Dave's drums. Pooch stands to my left, plugging his Les Paul into his amp. Colin's bending to his overdrive pedal at stage right, tweaking the knobs. Satisfied, he twists the volume on his Telecaster and hits two searing D chords. Wank, wank. Then Pooch flips his amp standby and joins in. Wank, 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 wank. I thump a couple eight notes to make sure my rig is working, feeling the low rumble in my scrotum. After five months grading essays and keeping office hours, these noises, distorted and raw, add up to a beautiful racket. Dave pops his snare a few times tightening the lug nuts until the drum cracks the way it ought to. And then he looks to Colin, who nods and mouths, Go, Dave, go! And the drummer launches into Sucker Punch, tonight's opening song. Colin jukes up to the mic and counts, One, two, one, two, three, four, and finally, Watershed is off and rocking. I sing the first line, and with the house lights down and the park hands shining in my eyes, I can't see the audience at all. I can almost fool myself into thinking we're headlining for 20,000 up the road at the Palace of Auburn Hills. For the boys in row J and the girls in row K and the poor suckers back in row double Z. I know that as soon as I take two steps to the left where the lights aren't directly in my face, I'll look out and see Joe the Animal and BAM! I'll be right back at Smalls, playing for five people. But that's okay. There's no point worrying about the 19,995 who didn't show up tonight. Our job is to play for the five who did. So Dave will chuck his drumsticks to the ceiling and catch them without missing a beat. Pooch will jump like a young Pete Townsend, putting the exclamation mark on a big chord. Colin will hop across the stage like the bastard son of Chuck Berry and Angus Young, spitting beer into the lights and urging the audience to clap and sing along. And the show will end with Colin and Dave flat on their backs, the stage littered with guitars and cymbal stands and beer bottles. All the while I'll be thinking, go ahead, call it a comeback. Watershed's back in the van, back on the road, aiming toward Chicago and New York in a big-ass room in Columbus. But first, tonight, topping the bill in Detroit, the main event in Motown, arena or no, we're headliners. 
and the word will rattle around my skull, carrying me through the between song silence until the moment immediately after the show when I take the piss I've been holding for an hour. And there on the wall above the toilet, I'll read graffiti that says, some nights you headline, some nights you just play last. Thank you. I'll stop. Taste for what this is like. We're Watershed's actually playing Smalls tonight at about 11 o'clock in Hamtramck. You can try the coffee at King Video and Convenience Mart if it's still there. Yeah. The lowest party store ever. <laughs> no, seriously, check it out. They have a, they have a uh, cockatoo on the bottle return shopping cart. There's a parrot in there. Like a bird. Wow, tropical that's bird. That's cool. I might have to start writing my next book from inside King Video. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, if there are any questions, maybe I can answer a question. Yeah, so let's, uh, I could play yeah, a song or two. We're going to get the guys to come up and uh, uh, do a couple songs, if, uh, if you guys will stick around. Yeah. And how about one more time, give a big hand for Kyle. Uh, for Kyle uh, that's right. uh, and are there any questions you guys uh, have immediately for Joe? Um, um, you mentioned that you were teaching English. Yeah. Uh, how did you manage to find the time to become a professor? Yeah, well, here's the thing. Like so many people, when things go sour, I went back to school, right? Like the economy goes sour, you go back to school. When Watershed was at a low ebb in our career, I went back to school and got a master's degree in creative writing. And we were still playing gigs all along that whole time. And this book actually started out, the first draft of this book was my master's thesis. It was a very different version of the book. That version was about 400 pages long, and I barely got us out of high school. I just started at the beginning and the end. Nobody wants to read that version of the book. Not Colin, not Joe the Animal, not Biggie, nobody. Right? So I've since taken the book through, I don't know, five or six more revisions to get to where this is. Yeah. And now I kind of have to write because it's my job, because that publisher parish thing, mm -hmm. that's kind of legit <laughs> in academia. Yeah. Any other questions? Same band, band members? Actually, the whole Colin and I have been together the whole time <laughs> since the garage and the folding papers. Our original drummer, Herb, quit after only 13 years. <laughs> and I will tell you, the straw that broke the camel's back with Herb was our month or two month long tour with the Insane Clown Posse. Mm. <laughs> I, I actually, I really liked those guys. And Colin and I had quite a bit of fun on that tour, but after 30 or so nights of an arena full of 14-year-old kids doing this to us, the whole <laughs> time, it, it pretty much took our drummer out of the game. So our, our new drummer has been with us since 1998. Wow. So, you know, he's a new guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you, uh, you going to write another book, Joe? I am going to write another book, yeah. Is it going to be on music business? Or it's not. It's going to be about high school football, actually. Yeah, in Conway, South Carolina, where I live now, in 1989, the Conway High School Tigers were coming off an 8-4 and four season, and it looked like they'd have a legitimate shot at winning the state championship because they had this returning quarterback who was going to be a senior, African-American guy, and a couple weeks before the first game, the coach benches the African-American guy in favor of a white guy with no experience. So 31 of the 35 African-American players on the team staged a boycott and walked off, completely walked off. They only won one game that year, and the game that they won was the last game of the year, and the only reason why they won it is because Hurricane Hugo came down in the middle of the season. They had to postpone that game to the end, and then they won that game. So I'm going to tell the story of that 1989 season, coupled with the current season, which is about to happen, which is the coach's 30th season at that team. The coach is still the coach of Conway High School. And the white quarterback that the coach elevated to the starting position is now the coach of Myrtle Beach High School, which is Conway's biggest rival. And so we're going to follow the Myrtle Beach team, the Conway team, this year and tell the story of this year and the story of the 1989 season when the African-American players boycotted. So not only are you a rock and roller, but you're a sports fan. And uh, I noticed that you used the metaphor of uh, the minor leagues of baseball for this particular... Uh, like, did you play sports uh, in high school? Or just See, Colin and I went <laughs> Worthington High School, where we went. Our graduating class was 690 people. 
you had to be really good to play sports at our high school. And I'll, I'll speak for myself here. I think Colin's a little better than me. I was just on the south side of average. <laughs> you know, so I didn't really make any of the teams. And you know, there was. I remember one time in middle school, I went to try out for the basketball team. I went through the first uh, tryout day, and that was fine. But the second day, Rush was playing in Cleveland, <laughs> and I said, "Forget tryouts. I'm going to see Rush." <laughs> when I got back to tryouts the next day, I found myself cut. Go figure. So I made the choice of rock and roll over sports mm -hmm. very early. Either that or the choice was made for me. Right. I've got a question. Yeah. You said that your father had a guitar in his closet and a <coughs> preacher? Yeah, okay. yeah. When, when uh, he was a younger they... man, he was a priest. Oh, okay. Uh, how did that You're talking inform... about a uh, Catholic priest? Yes. Or Catholic talking, priest. Right? Yeah. Uh -huh. How does that inform your choice for a career in rock and roll? Well, I think it takes a lot of faith. To climb into a, a van and travel from town to town to town, knowing that the rewards you get on the surface aren't going to look like what conventionally passes for success or what conventionally passes for rewards. The other night in Washington, D.C., we had a show that it seems to me was an absolute unadulterated success. There were about 40 people, everybody was having a good time. Fans were there singing every word to our songs. NPR was actually there to do a story about the band, which is going to air this Sunday, in cool. our weekend edition, to do a story about the band and the book. And then, how much did we make? Right? The one standard by which success is unfortunately measured. How much did we make? $37. Total. Total. Right? So it takes a lot of faith, I think, to get in the van and keep driving from town to town knowing that the rewards will be so Was there sketchy. any rebellious aspect of that? I guess I'm thinking, you know, the, the classic cliche, your dad's a preacher, you rebel and join a rock band. Nah, my dad was our biggest supporter from the very beginning. Oh, great. Yeah. Um, so you got published in Esquire magazine uh, yeah. more than once? or Yeah, a few times. Oh, yeah, no, guess my, I've been reading that for years. Yeah, so a few to, times. Me, for, to me, that's a, a good measure of success getting in there. What articles did you do? I had the remember. sweetest gig ever yeah. for Esquire magazine. I would go from town to town and write about the best bars in America. They <laughs> <laughs> just had that issue. The yeah, issue. If, I found, if I found a really good bar that I liked, I'd pitch it to the people in New York and say, send me to this bar to go drink yeah, some more. Yeah, that's a great yeah. gig. <laughs> that's pretty good. Oh, good. Yeah, and as a guy in a band, I'm maybe uniquely uh -huh. qualified for that gig. Yeah. Mary Ellen has a question. Would, would you do anything differently, and do you have any regrets? Hmm. Well, you know, in sports, keeping the sports metaphor, they say that, you know, for instance, a shortstop or a cornerback in football has to have a really short memory. You just get up and play the next play. Other than the writing of this book, which took a tremendous amount of energy looking back, we don't look back that often. Regrets, the only real regret I have, so we were on Epic Records, the big major label, for two years. And we released it one full-length album on Epic Records. And then they dropped us because the album, frankly, wasn't that good. We were young and we didn't really know what we were doing. I guess if I have anything like regret, it's I just wish we would have gotten one more shot while we still had all the resources of Epic Records behind us. Because I think we got a lot better shortly thereafter. But for Epic, it was too late. Well, how about taking a shot right now with us and inviting yeah. your friend Colin up sure. to do a song with you? Yeah, That'd absolutely. Um, I don't know if these guitars are in tune with each yeah, other. This, uh, boy. Except, you know what? You know what? I was there. I took the pictures. <laughs> but here's the it thing. It felt like five. Uh, <laughs> no, there was a moment at the beginning when I walked out and I did the count, and it was exactly five. I just never went back to count again. All right. But <laughs> yeah, maybe that's it. Very well researched. Okay, so how we give me like a G and let's see how this is. Off the new record, and then uh, we'll do yeah, something, something nice and old. And I would like to point out this is the only time we've done anything like this at all. So, Joe the Animal, you're sitting on some mirror footage right here. Well, yeah, I do remember the that the band doesn't come to the book readings, it's kind of weird to hear about yourself. But actually, I do remember truth. that one night when uh, we were in Ypsilanti where uh, the bus broke down, the uh, van broke down, and you guys had to. 
pull an emergency acoustic set because uh, you couldn't get any more of the gear there. I think I do remember that. Yeah, I do. I do. And right. that was the night that I sang with you guys. The first rule of show business is, you know, the show must go on. Yeah, absolutely. So second rule is always leave them wanting more. So I guess we should just stop right now. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. We're going to go ahead and cut off the supply right now. Right, so here's a song off the new record. Um, Joe's going to sing for you. It's called American Muscle. One, two, three, four. some banker rocks because they're doing so well. <laughs> Alright, so there's a song that's brand, brand new, right? And now we're going to play, and obviously I can sit there and Joe's written this amazing book, and obviously you think about it yourself because you're in the book, but um, <laughs> one of these people asked, you know, why you do it, one of the questions Joe asks is, well, why do you keep doing it, why do you keep doing it? And uh, looking back, especially in our relationship in Detroit and like with Sue being here, like we're these guys from the suburbs, from Inkton, and just as dumb luck would have it, we ran into these guys in Toledo that were from Detroit. And somehow we all became friends. We couldn't have a more different background. So early on, you know, it's actually Kevin was out in New York City, and we were talking about how you know, when you book gigs, you should just send packages yeah. and just wait, and you call the bar and wait. And Sue was one of the first people like give us gigs in Detroit, and we made it we, these networks of friends that we never would have met. And uh, this is a song that's way back. It's an old song, and actually the first time we appeared anywhere on a compact disc, it was the demo version of this song, which Sue, I think you put on your compilation Fistful of Chaos, which is a CD out of Detroit. And when you're from Columbus, Ohio, or pretty much anywhere, if you're on anything in Detroit, that's really cool. So this is actually the song that went on, that got us, kind of got us the record deal with Epic Records. So we're going to play a really old song that uh, was first released in Detroit, thanks to Sue, and we have so many friends up here still to this day. So, all right, let's try this thing. Yeah, let's give it a shot. feel? I got nothing 
to listen, guys. Pete is calling us, by the way. So where are you guys? Anybody's interested in books? We got a couple books for sale back in the room with the tea and cookies and the whole setup. Thanks again. One more so time, big hand for Joe Eisenberg and uh, Colin Powell from Watershed. We got a gig to go to, but uh, in the meantime, we got a few minutes to talk to them and have some treats. Uh, this show has been brought to you by Springfoot Arts, which is a nonprofit arts organization based out of Royal Oak. Uh, thanks to Diane DeSillis uh, for the Lido Gallery, uh, and Kelly and everybody that works here for uh, letting us do this. And we we'll hope to see you guys at other events. Pick up one of our newsletters and take it home with you, all right? Thanks a lot, guys. Okay, all right, thanks, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, the two, Colin and I write the songs. You write the songs? Yeah, we okay. write the songs yeah. together. Yeah, but she Kind of like songs. Lennon and McCartney, but infinitely yeah. not as successful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Lennon and McCartney, McCartney without all the hits. Yeah. <laughs>